Welcome to the Dirt World Podcast. I'm Jason Richman, a fourth generation road builder that started on a shovel and now serves as the chief operating officer at BuildWit. This is the Ariat Dirt World Summit Series, where we will dig into the construction world, exploring the challenges, successes, and strategies that shape exceptional leadership and builds a thriving workforce in the dirt world. Join us as we sit down with some of the brightest minds and trailblazers in the construction industry. Our guests are leaders who have navigated the trenches, built businesses, cultivated strong teams, and fostered innovation to build the infrastructure that shapes our world. From technology, equipment, suppliers, and contractors, their experiences and insights will inspire and empower professionals at every level. Please uh, help me welcome our guest, Kevin Goldberg, the co-founder and president of Soil Flow, a Western University environmental engineering graduate. Kevin began his career handling liquid waste solidification, where he recognized a crucial industry pain point the cumbersome management of disposal paperwork. In 2019, Soil Flow launched its software to help construction and environmental teams save time and reduce cost on tracking, record keeping, and compliance. Soil Flow is utilized on hundreds of construction sites daily with a significant customer base in Canada and now doing business in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia. Kevin, welcome to the Dirt World Podcast. Wow. Thanks so much, Jason. I appreciate that intro. Yeah. What do you think of that intro, man? Welcome to the Dirt World Podcast. Hey, it's uh, it's good. I think uh, it'll make my mom proud if she ever gets around <laughs> to this. So I think that's all that really matters, right? I love it. That's absolutely fantastic, man. Well, hey, it's, uh, it's super exciting to have you on. I'm excited to learn a little bit about your story, kind of the flow that we're going to go through today. Learn a little bit about you. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions about soil flow, really get into your business. We'll talk a little bit about leadership. We'll jump into some workforce development, what's going on in the world, and then we'll wrap it up with the Ariat Dirt World Summit. So, you know, just as we get started here on this uh, conversation, this podcast, tell me a little bit about your story, man. Give me your background. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you definitely touched on it in that intro there, but educated as an environmental engineer. I mean, I was always one of those kids, I'm sure like many other people listening to this podcast. And I mean, you grew up on the machines, it sounds, but enjoyed watching the construction site. So I always wanted to head that direction. Uh, landed in environmental engineering in school, which brought me to major pipeline projects after university. So on those pipeline projects, I was, you know, one of those engineering grunts who was responsible for, uh, being handed a stack of paper, you know, ceiling high and saying, hey, make sense of this, make sure all of our dirt went to the right place. And that was kind of the holy shit moment of, there's gotta be a better way here and I really don't wanna spend my time reconciling paperwork. Um, and that was really the genesis of it. From there, series of, you know, good, lucky, taking advantage of events, of regulation in Ontario and, uh, a modernizing, you know, workforce and construction industry really led kind of to the genesis of soil flow, I would say. Yeah. T so tell me again. So you started in construction in what year ballpark? Uh, that was probably 2017. 2017. And when yes, did soil right. flow come to fruition? 2019. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. So tell me a little bit about that, man. Starting a business, that's got to be <clears throat> super exciting and super scary all at the same time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it definitely didn't come without its challenges. I'm lucky to have a great business partner here, Adam Mattia, who I actually went to university with. Uh, he's very much on the product side of things. One of the techies stays behind the scenes, uh, doesn't get the pleasure of putting his face on podcasts. Um, and, you know, we were young at the time. So I mean that we were probably 24, 25, I would say. And uh, there wasn't much to lose, I would say at the time. We would put our heads together, put some, you know, concepts on paper. And really the most important part of everything was running it by the people we knew in the industry. So it didn't come without its failures and without its interviews of really hundreds of people, stakeholders we knew. Um, people in the industry are extremely generous uh, with time, I find, for young people. And people sat down with us, opened their books, showed us how they were doing it now, where they were losing money how they were making money and really 
that became the kind of crucial point of soil flow, the intersection of commercial and environmental teams, where really we find there's such a large divide um, as the status quo. You have environmental on one side, which you know often the commercial, the project management teams just see as a pain in their ass, and they're trying to just get through those hoops, cross those bridges, do the bare minimum, where we're really providing a tool that puts them together and gives them a mutual benefit where they're relying on each other you know, in many ways, having to support each other in order to, you know, achieve a common goal, which at the end of the day, if you're part of a business is profitability, making it to the next quarter, the next construction season. Yeah. Or the next pay cycle. Pay times. cycle. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it, man. Right. On. Okay. So I'm curious, uh, yeah. from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you know, where it started and where it is today, has there been a lot of pivots or has it been kind of just this slow adding, you know, features and benefits to, to who you are and what you do? I, I wouldn't say there's been a lot of pivots. There's definitely been a lot of additions. It has been exactly like you said, I mean, very much the cliche of a snowball, uh, just gaining momentum, you know, starting with a basic widget of truck leaving site, truck arriving at site, getting into different features like, you know, sending text messages to the drivers, putting in, you know, dashboards and progress, and then slowly starting to get into the tracking of imported aggregates, cement, asphalt, other materials. But there has been no deviation, I would say, from our original concept and an idea. Um, but, you know, if we look at Earthworks as, you know, a vertical, we're really just trying to tackle all those pain points that specifically Earthworks contractors, or I should say Dirt World contractors are dealing with really from the time or even before the time that shovel goes into the ground in many parts it's you know when we're doing the what we call the characterization of the site what is the soil in the ground is it clean is it contaminated all the way through close out handing it off and getting that crane pad in the ground for the most part 100 percent. so you know just to dig into soil flow specifically from your words not my mm -hmm. introduction words you know, for those people that have kind of been listening, but not listening, they've been distracted by a phone call, you know, it, explain to me again, what soil flow is and how does it work? Sure. Soil flow is an earthworks management solution that is really meant to tackle and digitize all of your processes when it comes to the dig and dump or import of material. The, what we traditionally see is a lot of paper ticket writing, a lot of tally writing, you know, on a sheet, okay, truck ABC did five loads, you know, EFG did 10 loads, and that's really as basic as it's going. For our bulk excavators or even, you know, the heavy civil road builders, like you said, you worked in, the T&D and the import is up to 75% of a project's total budget. You know, in many ways, it can be unacceptable to track that information with paper because it leads to delayed decision making for those owners in the back office. So you don't know that you've exported too much dirt, imported too much aggregate, paid too much money, had one driver who was goofing off for a full week and only got one load in a day. As an owner of a business, I want to know those things immediately. So what soil flow does is it introduces transparency really into that supply chain through digitizing a very basic process that's already going on in the field. And that is essentially truck counting in its most basic form. And I assume because it's digital, it's real time. People can see it. So from the office, you know, what's going on the field, you know, what's going on. Everybody's synced up. Everyone's synced up and on the same page. And in even many cases, it's actually even two sided where you can work with others in the industry. So we work on a ton of quarry rehabilitations, land developments where you're importing soils, right? You're exporting material from your road job. Where is that material going? You know, best case scenario, it's being beneficially reused on another job or on a quarry rehab. And that side can also use soil flow to really manage all of their imports from multiple contractors and even associate that with the environmental portion of their work. So when you're importing soils, you need to make sure it's clean material. You don't want to be contaminating your quarry. Yes, you want to rehab it, but if it's an active quarry, that's your money maker. If you have to stop operations because you brought in contaminated soil, you're basically screwed. Yeah, 100%. So 
I'm assuming these are third party trucks. Correct. So you've got digital software. I'm, I'm starting to figure that out. I've now got the clients are environmental and construction and all that. I've, now we've got this third party trucker. How are you tracking? Like, is this by cell phone? Is this GPS? Do you have to have partnerships? Like, how does the actual technology work? Just out of curiosity. So our, our secret sauce, Jason, in this entire industry is the fact that we don't involve the truck driver at all. Okay. So the way that it works is we rely on your one person who is always in the field, either doing the traffic control, backing up that truck. If it's a low volume enough site, it could be that excavator operator. Someone in the field is responsible at the end of the day for the comings and goings of material, and which is ultimately in many cases gonna control the profit and loss of your site as well. So we propose putting somebody in charge, one single person, rather than the 20, 50, 100, potentially thousand different third party owner operator dump truck drivers um, relying on your person, not the people you cannot control. From yeah. an implementation perspective, it also means that we're only having to make sure that one person is successful in the field rather yeah. than a thousand on a daily basis. Yeah. Okay, so I got to ask a silly question. I've, sure. I've, I've been in the field. I've had to count trucks before. Nice. I had pen and paper. I was doing hash marks. Okay. And then I go, uh, I can't remember. Did that truck come in? Did I hash them? Did I not? Did I get them? To... So how does your one person, even though they've got all this technology, yeah. What if the what if the human forgets to track them in or track them out? Like, is there a double check? Is there it, like, how does that work? It, it's a great question. It can happen. I mean, it does happen at the end of the day. If you're doing hundreds of loads per day, you might miss a truck. Generally, because it is real time and digital, you're able to check these things a lot easier. So you're going to look at your run sheet. You're going to have five trucks working for you. You're going to see that four of them did five loads and one only did four loads. So you're going to say to that driver, or, or you're, did I miss a load for you? Or they're gonna say, no, I didn't. Or they're gonna hand you their end of day slip, which says that they did five loads. And you can usually tell based off of the times if yeah. you missed a load or not. So, I mean, I, this goes to the whole topic and theme of Dirt World Conference in general and about the person, our end user, who's in the field. Yeah. And really it comes down to the fact that they're not dumb. Right. And everyone, you know, we so often get on these calls where the, oh, my field user will never do that. They'll never be able to do that. But I know that during their lunch break, they're in the trailer trading their stocks or, you know, trading Bitcoin or whatever it might be doing whatever else they're doing on their cell phones because they've had a smartphone for the last 10 years and they aren't done. Yeah. Okay. So tell me a little bit about, so we've got contractor that's interested, like, man, this is great technology. I'm super interested. This is going to solve all my pain points I'm having. We're, we're, you know, I'm assuming they go to a website. Do they mm -hmm. download it? What's the purchase process? You know, how does, how does this work? Sure. So, I mean, one of the, I know we're kind of going to get into values and stuff. So like one of our values that we have is really putting ourselves in our users shoes or steel toed boots as we say and when we think about that end user one of them came down to implementation in the field so when it comes to what are they using it on we actually go with a web-based software doesn't matter what device you have in the field tablet phone computer you have access to a browser you can access soil flow you can download it from there but as the bare minimum they're going to be able to access that information what it also allows us to do is push the updates without them having to make sure their phone's updated all the time and um, downloading the latest software and, you know, iOS this and, you know, Android that. That's kind of implementation in the field, super easy. From a purchasing perspective, I mean, we get calls from either construction managers or environmental managers. Hey, I'm interested. We hop on a 30 minute demo. We show them how to use it. Yeah, you either like it or you don't, to be totally honest with you. Uh, pricing isn't cost prohibitive. And, you know, we'll usually start on one project. They give it a shot. They like it. We'll set up an annual job. It's pretty simple. It's not rocket science here, right? 
Um, very easy to measure your return on investment very quickly. I'm looking to save you the overbilling of one or two trucks a month. Mm -hmm. That's it. If you can yeah. save on one or two trucks a month, if you as the business owner can you know, go home two hours earlier on Friday so you can make it out to the country or to the cottage or whatever, you know, I'm a happy guy. I've done my job for you and your business. I love it. So we talked about it a little bit in the intro about based in Canada, doing business now in, in multiple countries. Talk to me a little bit about your geography and locations and service and, and growth. For sure. Right now, like our genesis was Toronto, greater Toronto area, or should I should say Ontario, really. We have a large presence in uh, Ottawa and really throughout Ontario. Um, we had a regulation and the genesis of soil flow really was a regulation on excavated soil in the province. We see this across the world, you know, major urban centers are expanding. We're building deep condo excavations, tunnels, large hideaways. I mean, the U.S. has the new infrastructure bill. And what happens is we start to display so much dirt that it's either becoming more contaminated because we need to go into those brand fields or we're running out of places to put it or both. What that leads to is illegal dumping. It leads to bad outcomes, contaminated soils on farms, you know, bad events and a regulation comes in. And that's what happened in Ontario. And we actually modeled our regulation after the UK. So here in Ontario, we have a fantastic presence. You know, uh, we're a very big presence in the industry. And our first kind of stepping stone is actually the United Kingdom, where we officially launched some point last year. Uh, business is going well there. And what we realized is that the United States can be tricky with 50 different states and 50 different regulations. But what Ontario allowed us to do was to get into the hands of more earth movers, more dirt world members, that type of persona than any other business out there from a software perspective. So a lot of the current uh, construction softwares are very GC focused, owner focused, and nobody's thinking about the dirt world. So, you know, because of this reg and because of us building this product, we're in the hands of over 200 excavation subcontractors, heavy civil businesses. And we realize now that we've proved that they will use software and the field users are smart and willing to do it and as are the business owners there's tons of opportunity to move beyond regulatory requirements and into operational efficiency and what we call operational excellence and that is how we've kind of to your to your point earlier not pivoted but added to the software in order to launch into the united states really so our goal for the United States is 100% to help anyone with any regulatory requirements that they might have with where's their soil going. But really what we're interested in is helping you be more efficient, helping you make more money, and then ensure that everything is operating smoothly. Yeah, 100%. So primary target audience is contractors. Excavation, subcontractors, heavy civil, absolutely. Yeah, as I was surfing the... Your website, you know, I was noticing some case studies, you know, looks like you've got, you know, several organizations that you've been working with and each one of them, you know, obviously sharing problem solution, you know, et cetera. Any of those case studies kind of jump out or any, any, uh, any circumstances where you've been working with somebody and it's like, man, this is the value prop that they're just like so excited about, you know, where it's really solved a problem for them. <laughs> The one that I always get really excited about is the, uh, of course, the cost savings, because at the end of the day, people buy because they're either saving money or making more money. And I believe we have a case study on one of it, but it really has to do with our hauler accounts payable features and reconciliation of loads. And that's just the concept of an excavation subcontractor getting bombarded by their hauling subcontractors with the invoices. I have some, uh, some of my clients are getting a two to $300,000 invoice weekly from different sub ex uh, hauling subcontractors. So providing a platform for them to reconcile that information. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm here. I'm not talking about saving on one or two loads a month of being overbilled or double paying for a load here. We're talking about dozens of loads that, you know, for, 
30 years have been slipping through the cracks because it was just such a mess of paperwork. They have entire rooms dedicated to literally reconciling paperwork from their source sites and their run sheets and their paper run sheets, which are covered in coffee and rain if they even show up to the office with all of these hauling slips stacked to the ceiling. So anytime that a contractor is able to leverage those features on soil flow, what it means is we've successfully implemented with them in the field and they're confident, confident enough in the data to use our features to reconcile their payables, which I think is, you know, for me, it's the golden goose of using soil flow. You know, you'll make your money 10 times over. Yeah. Last question about soil flow until we kind of jump into some of the other topics, just kind of curious from a vision standpoint of, so, you know, soil flow, you know, uh, every business is always iterating and looking at the future and what's coming and new technology, new features, new things, you know, whatnot. Is there anything that, you know, you're super excited about or, or working to solve for, or maybe things that you're seeing that, that, that you're interested in and in starting to pursue and tackle? Yeah, for sure. Our, our goal is to be the main software that any company in the dirt world is relying on on a daily basis. You know, what that means for me is being able to provide them with better, easy to understand analytics and actionable insights than they've ever had before. And we're not quite there yet. We're working on it. But, you know, being able to interpret, you know, these hauling logs into production rates per excavator, how many loads you're getting in per excavator. And I know right now that a lot of the more advanced, you know, next gen CAD equipment and the Komatsus, et cetera, you know, they have a lot of this stuff built in, but you know, we're frequently hearing that a large, a large organization, they don't just have Caterpillar, they don't just have Komatsu, they don't just have Volvo, they have all of them and they don't want to, you know, sign into five different uh, platforms. So being able to provide that information in different ways and being able to provide them with actionable insights and analytics um, is hopefully where we'll get to. And again, we'll be able to unlock that if an organization is truly using soil flow for everything it has. Yeah, that's fantastic. Really cool beautiful business that you've built solving, you know, a real Thanks. problem in the industry and, you know, leveraging technology kind of starts to lead us into these next two subject matter, you know, leadership and workforce development, you know, you hear about technology and, you know, how that's going to impact, um, you know, the industry, the dirt world as a whole, uh, just by statistics, um, you know, they say 40% of the industry is going to retire by the year 2031. You know, in the U.S., we need 560,000 new skilled tradespeople coming in every year. You know, I'm not exactly sure where that sits in Canada, uh, but just, you know, kind of curious, you know, as we as we start to really try to, you know, attract this next generation and and really, um, you know, take care of what we have and get more people to come in. I want to talk to you a little bit about leadership and maybe what are some of the challenges that, that you see in the dirt world that leaders are facing today? We'll maybe start with that. Definitely. I mean, first of all, I think uh, BuildWit, obviously, and Dirt World, and I mean, a, a lot of the contributors here um, are doing a great job to tackle this problem. And really, the main problem around it is perception of the industry and what it is. Um, at the end of the day, the biggest challenge that we can't tackle that our industry is faced with is, is weather and the current other opportunities out there. And that's what I find. So the, some of our users are freezing their asses off in, you know, minus 25, you know, with the wind chill that's Celsius, you know, on the flip side, they're down in 110 degree heat in Texas. You know, those are things that we can't really solve. Maybe someone will come up with some, you know, pretty yeah. interesting equipment to solve that. I don't know. Um, but we need, we need to change the perception of who that person in the field is and what is their responsibility. Now, I remember having the conversation with Benjamin from Dirt World about this, about the role that technology does play in this. Because when somebody's coming out of school, they don't want on their first day to be handed a pad of paper and say, hey, you know, hash down every single truck that leaves and that's their job. I mean, they'll pick up a pretty nasty smoking habit probably uh, in that time. 
and just be bored, bored off their faces and go and look to do something else. And I'll actually probably not do that job very well because they're so bored. The company they're joining, they want to see that they are investing in technology. They are investing in their people. They are trying to make the job more interesting and cater it to that next generation. Absolutely I, love that. That's, that's, that's fantastic. I could not agree more with the storytelling. Something that you were hitting on, though, that's really interesting to me is, is like, we need to be genuine and authentic in our storytelling. We need mm -hmm. to tell them that it's hot. We need to tell them that it's cold. We need to tell them that it's dirty. I mean, like, there's a part of that, like, you got to know what you're signing up for. I mean, mm -hmm. am I going to run, you know, a marathon or am I playing football? And it's like, people want to know what they're getting into. And then we equip them with the best, you know, uh, equipment possible to do their jobs as efficiently and productive and let them know how they play an instrumental part of the whole. And so to me, I think you're, you're really touching upon, you know, a really important thing, which is that storytelling, but really just letting them know what to expect and what they're signing up for and that we need their help and support. And so it's leadership is really what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that communication, it's that setting those expectations, it's creating that sense of accountability of what, you know, what they're going to be responsible for. And so you know, as you lead in the dirt world, you know, what are some of your leadership principles and philosophies that you kind of lean into when you're guiding and coaching and communicating with your people? For sure. I mean, to be fair, uh, I'm, I mean, not fortunate enough, but I don't have to deal with that problem. Most, most of, you know, my team are software developers who are sitting nice and cozy, probably still in their pajamas, uh, just getting into their computers right now, starting sure. to write some code. Um, but I do think I have my own I have my own challenges, right, which are which are relatable. Um, and they do come down to our core values and ultimately investing back in our people. Um, so when it comes to our values, I mean, first of all, like our number or one of our number ones is just good vibes. That's something we just look for, you know, and it's really supporting each other when it comes to that, right. Uh, when you walk into our office, you know, that's what we expect to see. People have bad days that I'm not saying you have to put a smile on all the time, but hopefully somebody else can pick them up or, you know, stay away from them if they need to. Um, the other is just keeping it interesting. So we're not just problem solvers. We're also problem hunters, right? Um, we have the pleasure of being able to do that because we kind of see it out of bird's eye view, but that's also within our own business, right? We're always trying to look and improve on our business, improving our processes, and ultimately, again, relating it back to all businesses, improving ourselves. Because at the end of the day, you know, our people are the greatest asset in our business, and we think that improving ourselves ultimately leads to that theme of operational excellence. Mm. And, you know, investing in those field people, understanding, being like, hey, this was a cold one today. I know it was a cold one. You know, how could we do better and support you on these super cold days when we have to make sure production is up? Um, we have a client who has a lot of machinery and uh, they've been around for a long time. And because of that, they have an aging fleet, not just aging personnel, but also an aging fleet. And when I see say fleet, I mean, the dozers, I mean, the excavators and so on. And, um, you know, it's being taken over by young leadership now, kind of next generation. And he was just talking about how they have to buy new dozers because people don't want to go and work for them in the middle of the summer in an open, you know, in an open air dozer when they're backing up all the dust going in their face and they're leaving looking like they just came out of a coal mine. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's just an example of kind of you're investing in assets for your team to make your number one asset, your team more efficient and better and want to show up to work the next day. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, it's kind of interesting hearing you talk about that. We're transitioning into workforce development a little bit, but you know, to me, one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, we have a responsibility if we're going to attract this next generation to create a place that people want to be an environment that they, that they want to be a part of, whether that's lead through leadership, like, you know, making sure that they're getting the education, training, recognition, support, where it's the equipment, the brand, the culture, the values, whether it's the, you know, the, the work life balance, whether, you know, whatever that is, you know, uh, businesses now have to really walk the walk. And because, you know, this next gen has a choice, 
they're looking at your, your digital footprint and they're trying to figure out, do I want to go work for company A, B, or C? And they're going to look at, do they have core values? How do they treat their people? What's the equipment like? Is, do they have a cool brand? Is this something that, you know, like you said, is my mom going to be excited about this? You know, as we talked about it at the beginning of the podcast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, it's, it's interesting to me to hear you talking about that personally, because I do think that even though you may have a bunch of developers, there's not as many dirt world field type people, you're still a dirt world person and you're a mm -hmm. leader and there are things that you have to do, whether it's implementation, whether it's sales, whether it's development, you know, whatever that may be. So what do you do? Uh, to kind of work on, you know, upskilling, learning and development, personal growth, you know, is it books? Is it podcast? Is it like, what is it that you're doing uh, to, to, to lean into that? Yeah, to be honest with you, I, I'm not a big book guy. You can ask anyone in the office that I'm definitely uh, made fun of for that. I'm also not a big podcast guy, but I really learn from other people. And that's what I learn into, uh, lean into, sorry. Um, originally that was, you know, my own personal mentors, uh, you know, people above me, people in the industry. And now I'm finding it's more my peers within the business. I mean, we're a very flat organization. We're a very young organization as well, um, which won't be for long and shouldn't be for long to say, but it's just where we are now. Um, and people are, you know, critical of each other and me in very good ways. So being extremely self-aware of those facts and being able to understand where you're lacking and listening to that feedback and then working on improving yourself and that has been the most crucial thing for me really in my development. And you know, I, I think about where my partner and myself were at, my business partner and myself were at you know, five years ago to today and not only are we different people, but we're literally in different points of life than we were then either. Yeah. Um, and it's just those life experiences. I'm just always trying to learn from those life experiences more than anything else. Yeah, it's good. I had a, I had a mentor that told me once you should always have a mentor or a leader in your life that's 10 years older and 10 years younger. And so you've got right. this span of, of, you know, you know, 20 years where you're, you're having these conversations about, you know, just life and work and leadership and, you know, technology and everything that's going on. And so, you know, I, I, I really can lean into, I love people and I love, you know, learning mm -hmm. from others. And so I guess the most important thing is, is just to have that learn and grow mindset of asking great questions, you know, learning from others, not being a know-it-all, you know, making sure that, you know, if you, if you don't know how to do something or if you don't know where you're going, it's okay to ask for directions type, type conversation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, I think I know dirt and I know people and beyond that, you know, I'm really looking at the others around me to fill those gaps. Yeah, for sure. You know, one thing that's interesting is I think about this, you know, and, and your business specifically, I start to think about man, you may not have a workforce challenge specifically at your business. However, in order for your business to thrive, the industry needs to be thriving. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it really starts to make me think about your investment in the Dirt World Summit and, you know, coming to the Dirt World Summit, um, you, you know, People are all coming there to learn and grow and figure out how to solve leadership and workforce development challenges. And so by virtue of, of participating and supporting and coming, you're going to be helping these companies with their biggest problem in the industry. Then therefore with their success, you have an opportunity to really sell your products and services to them. Sure. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, the area at Dirt World Summit, what are you most excited about uh, and what do you hope to get out of it? Definitely, I, I think those were all good points. When I first spoke to Benjamin, I suppose, about the Dirt World Summit, the, the first question is, okay, who's gonna be there, right? And the key theme that I realized about the person that's gonna be there or the business that's gonna be there is it is somebody who has recognized that they have a problem and that is being the workforce and or leadership are will are now want to improve themselves or improve their business based off of that problem 
and most importantly, see the value of investing their own time and money in solving that problem. And the problem identification, taking the time to review that problem and then investing to solve that problem is the exact same process that happens when somebody chooses to purchase our software, right? The people who will purchase our software are the people who can look at themselves in the mirror and say, you know what, my business is 30 years old and I've been doing it one way for the past 30 years, but I do recognize that there's probably a lot of money slipping through the cracks over the past 30 years. And the unfortunate part is when they run the math in their head and they realize that that was potentially millions of dollars literally directly out of their pocket that they're like, oh crap, I have a problem here. And I have had a problem for a very long time. Okay, how can I fix it? Okay, I value software, I value the solution, which is new in our industry enough to actually go ahead and pay for it, right? So for me, the Dirt World Summit is really more a collection of you know people who happen to be good potential buyers of my services, but who are looking to improve themselves and improve the industry together and spend money on that. And for me, that that's really uh, what was exciting about it is if you look at all of the other conferences out there, a lot of them are educational for sure. A lot of them are on the consulting side. A lot of them are on the general contractor side. There's local associations who I think, you know, our industry is really good at banding together locally to, you know, push their problems with representatives. We have great associations locally here, but it was really the first conference I found, you know, that's really dedicated to these earth movers who are, I mean, undervalued in the construction supply chain, in my opinion. Yeah, no, hundred percent. It's really, uh, really good points that you're making there. You know, uh, in January, this event didn't exist. And so it's been moving fast, uh, sure. typical build wit style, you know, from idea, uh, concept to, uh, deliverable, it has been an incredible, uh, thing to be a part of. Uh, one thing I can say though, that's been interesting is, you know, incredible speaker lineup, you know, with Jocko Willink, you know, from an, you know, from echelon front with the mini muster that we're going to do on the, on the full day, you know, we've got uh, Bob Chapman, uh, who wrote the book, everybody matters. We've got Marcus Sheridan who wrote, they ask you answer. We've got Joe Hart who wrote the book, take, take command with Dale Carnegie. We've got Dave Turin. I mean, it is just an incredible lineup of people. If you haven't read those books, you don't like to read those books. That's okay. There's tons of audio books or some clips, but it would be worth anybody's time to check those out prior to. Uh, but one thing that I'm really excited about this, we called it a summit for a reason. And I can remember being in the, the conversations with the team and it was like, you know, most people go to a conference and they check it out. They don't tell anybody they're going. They go and have a great time, have drinks, stay out too late, get up too late, you know, etc. Then they go home and they're, it's just back to status quo. It's just, that's just all there is to it. What we're finding is that people are sending teams. There's two, three, five people coming from a company and they're coming on a mission. They're coming to learn, they're coming to grow. They want to, to your point, they want to figure out this problem, but they're looking for solutions. And what we're excited about is they're going to meet, you know, supporters like yourself. They're going to meet, uh, you know, some great or, you know, speakers. Uh, there's going to be some great partners. They're going to benchmark from, uh, you know, other industry peers that are there and they're going to learn and grow at this event, but they're going to go away on Monday with this toolkit of all these people and all these things that they've learned and they can figure out how do I apply this at my organization? What, what, you know, let's do a debrief. Let's figure out all right, what do we learn? What are we doing? Well, what are we not doing well? And how are we going to apply this? And so, you know, I think it's going to be interesting even for you as mm -hmm. you meet all of these people to figure out like where it's a great idea. Like where's everybody at? How are they solving this problem? And then how can I add value from it? You know, to these, to these people moving forward. So I'm really excited if you can't tell about the summit. I hope you're just as excited. I am, we're stoked. We can't, uh, we can't wait to head down. The whole team's looking forward to it. Uh, we're actually booking flights today. So uh, we're definitely looking to make an impact. And most of all, like you said, meet everyone, 
get their feedback, figure out how they do it today. And at the end of the day, I think kind of similar to you guys, we're in the business of solving problems. And that's exactly, you know, what we want to hear is people not to shy away from the problems, but be open about them, honest about them and work with us for solutions. I love that. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us on the Dirt World podcast. Uh, we're grateful for Soil Flow's support at the Area Dirt World Summit and all that you're doing to make the dirt world a better place. Um, where can people find you uh, online? Uh, soilflow.com, S-O-I-L-F-L-O. Uh, on LinkedIn, add me on LinkedIn. Kevin Goldberg would be happy to hear from you just to connect, chat, whatever it is. Uh, don't be a stranger. Absolutely. Well, as we wrap up, you can learn more about the Ariat Dirt World Summit. Just go to dirtworld.com and you'll find all the details. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, keep leading in the dirt world, building people, projects, and communities. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate the time.